Hey, Physics 30s. It's me, Mr. Juke again. Fun fact, I just recorded this whole lesson, but I didn't turn my microphone on. So here we are. Take two, sort of. Uh, we are on the last lesson of... Let me get a nice felt pen out here. This is actually how I started out the last lesson, too, with getting a better felt pen. It's lesson nine. Unit 5, it's all about modern physics, our quantum mechanical model of the atom. Let's jump right in. Uh, first thing we're going to talk about, I guess, is matter waves. This is, and it sounds like it's a bit of a left-hand turn, but it's going to help us explain the uh, the quantum mechanical model of the atom, or the Schrodinger model of the atom. So, we remember way back when, Compton conclusively showed that photons behave both as wave and particles. I don't want to say that they are waves behave like particles. I know that's what it says down here because they're particles, they're waves, they're kind of both, they're kind of neither. They're just so strange and so wonderfully different. Um, what we do want to get into is Louis de Broglie, de Broglie uh, suggested, well, what if, what if the opposite could true? What if, what if particles could behave more like waves? And he did this because, well, a belief in symmetry in the universe is where it started all off. So, what he kind of came up with was the idea of the wavelength of matter. So, if it behaves as a wave, or if it behaves as a particle, well, it should have the same momentum either way. So, if we remember from previous uh, times in the unit here, previous lessons in the unit, we know the particle for a wave is Planck's constant. Sorry, yeah, that didn't make any sense. The momentum for a wave is Planck's constant divided by the wavelength, and we know that the momentum for a particle is mass times velocity. Cool. So, if I wanted the wavelength then, well, I could just rearrange and say, well, it's going to be, uh, let's see, Planck's constant divided by the mass and divided by the velocity. So now we've got a formula to actually check out and to actually look at the wavelength of matter. Cool. Something to know with this hey, is that, uh, yes, wavelength has an inverse relationship with speed. It also, though, has an inverse relationship with wavelength. Speed has a limit, right? 10 to the power of 6, and most particles, or sorry, 10 to the power of 8, 3 times 10 to the power of 8. Second time through this is going worse somehow. But anyways, uh, there is a speed limit, so it can only get so big there, but the mass can get ridiculously small, like 10 to the negative 30, and this typically only really works. Holy mackerel, I did wavelength there as well. This typically only works with really, really, really small masses, or at least is only noticeable with really small masses. Okay, let's check out a quick example here. We got a particle moving at a speed of 6.5 times 10 to the power of 7. It has a kinetic energy of 25 electron volts. We want to determine its wavelength. So I'm just going to go back. Here's our formula for wavelength. I need Planck's constant. Well, that's easy. That's constant. I need the speed that's given to us. I need the mass. Hmm. So I've got speed and kinetic energy. I should be able to figure out mass. One little problem that we've got here is my kinetic energy is in kilo electron volts, where really I want it in joules if we're using 0.5 mv squared. So I'm going to start with kinetic energy is 25,000 electron volts. Let's see, I want to get rid of electron volts. I want to end up with joules. I know that one electron volt is 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 joules. So let's see, electron volts cancel. Take a moment to plug that into your calculator. Looks like we get, oh, a nice easy number, 4 times 10 to the negative 15 joules. Nice. So step one, we've changed our kinetic energy into joules. Step two, we can now use our EK is equal to 0.5 mv squared formula. Uh, because this one has joules, we want to rearrange and we want to solve for m. So m must be EK over 0.5 v squared. We've now got all those values. So let's go ahead and plug them in. 4, 10 to the negative 15 joules divided by 0.5 divided by the speed squared. What was the speed? 6.5 times 10 to the power of 7. And then we just want to remember to square that one here. So the mass, take a moment to plug that into your calculator. I end up with 1.893 times 10 to the negative 
30 kilograms. So tiny, kind of as expected, but tiny. Next piece is, well, I want to determine its wavelength. Well, regardless of whether it's behaving more like a particle or behaving more like a, uh, a wave, its momentum is its momentum. So if it's behaving like a wave, it's h over wavelength, or Planck's constant divided by the wavelength. If it's behaving more like a particle, it's mass times velocity. So again, we can go through and we can say, okay, the wavelength must be equal to Planck's constant over mv. Now with Planck's constant, we're using our standard kilograms, meters, seconds. So we, we probably want the version with regular joules, because joule, remember joules is a kilogram, meter squared over second squared. So that's 6.63, there we go, times 10 to the negative 34 joule seconds. And then we want to divide that by the mass. We just figured that out, 1.893 times 10 to the negative 30. Of course, that's kilograms. And then uh, the speed was 6.5 times 10 to the power 7 meters per second. Do not square that one. Remember, in the kinetic energy, we're squaring. In this one, not so much. Plug the numbers in. And turns out to be, and hopefully everybody agrees, 5.39 times 10 to the power of negative 12 meters. Now that's tiny, but it's not so tiny that it's unnoticeable for something that is 10 to the negative 30 kilograms. So very, very small. If that was my wavelength, oh, you would never notice that. I move more than that every single second, even when I'm sitting as still as humanly possible. But if that's something that's ridiculously tiny, like a proton or like an electron or whatever this thing is, then all of a sudden it becomes more noticeable. Cool, okay, I give myself some space to work. Hey, my answer is right, so that's good. So this is fine. I mean, thinking that particles can behave like a wave is one thing, but actually doing an experiment to figure out that they are behaving as waves is another. So uh, if you search in YouTube, proof of mind over matter. One of the first videos that comes up is the double slit experiment. Uh, it is the one that is six minutes and nine seconds. I would like you to check out this video. I'd like you to start, I mean, you can watch the whole thing, but uh, it's actually just a clip out of a larger video called, I believe it's down the rabbit hole. Um, it's super cheesy. It's a cartoon about this, but it really does a good job showing the double slit experiment. Uh, and what we're looking at starts at about 24-ish seconds into the video. So again, the first part is just a cut from another scene. So go ahead, put it on pause, check that out right now. All right, <laughs> what did you think? It's pretty, uh, pretty wild video, right? Pretty wild ideas. So let's just go through the big ideas that we need to know for our class. So double slit experiment. We know that particles do not diffract. They do not interfere with each other, right? So that's, that's fine, right? If I send particles through, that's not the next slide. If I send particles through, no diffraction, we just get two beams behind. That's fine. If I send waves through, well, they diffract and then they interfere with each other and we get a series of maxima and a series of minima. So we get that diffraction pattern. We take this down to the quantum level and we do this with electrons. We shoot electrons through these double slit experiment. Well, if they're particles, we would expect to see two lines. But that's not what happened. What happened was we saw the diffraction pattern at this. So they're diffracting, they're interfering with each other. They are behaving like waves behave. And in the video, you saw this, okay, maybe that's fine with a whole bunch of them. Even one of them can do that, right? One of them can go through as a wave of potentials. It can go through both slits and it can interfere with itself. And in the video, it got even crazier, absolutely crazier because there's like mathematics that show that it's going through both of the slits at the same time. It's going through one slit. It's also going through the other slit. And it's also going through neither of the slits all at the exact same time. 
a lot of stuff is happening in the which is wild. It's pretty crazy. We'll talk about that a little bit more as we go through the, the class. So we watched the video. The important thing to know for this particular class is uh, just, and not that we really have an exam necessarily, but uh, just know that the electrons made an interference pattern, they were behaving as waves. That's the big thing. So one application that we often see from this is microscopes. You've heard of electron microscopes. So here's the thing that we need for any microscope, for any microscope for good resolution. So the wavelength has to be approximately equal to the diameter of the thing that we're trying to look at. So for visible light, which is on the nanometer scale, there's approximately a wavelength, which means we can see things that are approximately that big. And now this is not at all to scale, but just kind of given you the idea. So that's fairly large stuff that we can get resolution on. I mean, it's still in the nanometer scale, but it's not, uh, it's not tiny, tiny. It's tiny, but it's not tiny, tiny. If I were to use electrons that have now on the picometer scale, so 10 to the negative 12, the cutest meters of all the picometers, we can all of a sudden see things that are considerably smaller. Right? And I mean I do mean considerably smaller. So on the UV scale, right, we might be able to see mitochondria. You could not see that with visible light, no matter how hard you try, individual mitochondria. And then even on the picometer scale. Right, so now talking about X-ray-ish wavelengths, we can see DNA, we can see individual chromosomes, which is crazy. That's so small. You cannot. It is physically impossible to see visible light because visible light doesn't really interact with those, which is pretty crazy. Now, electron microscopes, light microscopes, there's actually a whole bunch of different types of electron microscopes, but the ones that we're talking about work essentially the same way so you send a beam of light it reflects off of a specimen it goes back up and you pick it up you send a beam of electrons it reflects off of a specimen uh, it has to go through a uh, fluorescent screen or film in order to actually see anything or computerized is another way to look at it and then we're looking at the screen the film we're looking at the uh, the computer screen rather than looking directly at the specimen cool so things that I like about this is as you increase the magnification, you typically increase the resolution and you get these crazy things like a bug's eye. If you, uh, if you want to check this out, just look up electron microscope images on the internet. You find all kinds of crazy stuff like bed bugs, uh, lice, bugs are always kind of the grossest, uh, a spider's face, all crazy. Here's white blood cells and red blood cells. Any ideas why there's no color? the wavelength is too small and it's not real color. Okay, so <clears throat> next kind of pieces, I suppose, that, uh, that get us in this quantum model is the Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. So Heisenberg, here he is right here, uh, is, uh, he said it's impossible to know the exact position and momentum of an individual particle at the same time. In other words, it's impossible to know where it is and where it's going at the exact same time which is kind of weird to think about, right? And this this gets us into the end of that Dr. Quantum video where it, uh, where it showed a little bit about as soon as you observe something, you change it, right? You, you change it. So it's kind of talking about that. Now, the reason for this is, well, how do we observe things? We typically use EMR. So we send EMR out, it interacts with something, we send it back, and we look at whatever is sent back. So there's two options for this. We could use really short wavelength EMR. Remember, shorter wavelengths means higher energy, means higher momentum, right? So that's fine. So I send it out, you know, it hits my electron, it comes back to the receiver. Notice there's very little diffraction here, right? So the waves here, that means it could have come from anywhere in that sort of range. We have a pretty darn good idea of where that electron was at one particular point in time, but we know that high frequency means high momentum and high momentum photons collide with electrons and they can actually make them change their course. So we now know nothing. We knew where it was, but we now know nothing about where it's going or where it really came from, right? So we can know where it was, but we can't know its momentum because we've now changed its momentum as soon as we interact with it. The second option is to use longer wavelength EMR. 
So longer wavelength means lower momentum. Lower momentum is nice because there's going to be very little deflection. So it's going to continue essentially along the same path. So we can now have information about its path, about its momentum. Problem is, the longer the wavelength, the more diffraction we have. So the more diffraction we have, the less likely it is that we know where that electron was at a particular point in time. So again, we can either know where it was or we can know where it's going, but we cannot know both. Next person we're going to talk about is Schrodinger's cat. Lots of people make jokes about Schrodinger's cat. Fewer people understand why Schrodinger's cat is around anyways. So here's a joke about it for some of you may or may not actually understand, but uh, yeah, we'll go back. We'll talk about it a bit more. So the whole idea with Schrodinger's cat, he's trying to explain to everyday people how exactly something could be going through both slits, neither slits, one slit, the other slit, all at the exact same time, all superimposed in time. And the idea that observing something changes the outcome. Observing something gives you a definitive outcome. So here's the experiment. And you should also know that Schrodinger was not an evil person. He did not torture any cats. No cats were killed in this whatsoever. It's just a thought experiment. So here's the deal. You've got a sealed box. You cannot hear in or out of that box. You cannot you know, feel vibrations through the wall. You cannot see into or out of that box. And you put a cat in the box, and you put one radioactive atom in that box as well. So radioactive atoms, we should know, in a given period of time, they have a 50-50 chance of either decaying or not decaying. We'll talk about more about decay and stuff in Unit 6, but they've always got a 50-50 chance in a particular amount of time. Kind of like flipping a coin, right? So if I say you're allowed to flip a coin every 30 seconds, you flip it once in 30 seconds, there's a chance that it's heads or tails. And I tell you, as soon as it's heads, you got to get rid of it, right? Until you look, you don't really know if it's heads or tails. So here's the deal with this. If it does not decay, this lever stays up, the hammer stays up, a vial of poison gas stays unbroken, and the cat stays alive. If it does decay, and again, it's just a chance, right? A random chance. If it does decay, this lever falls, the hammer falls, breaks, spills the poison everywhere, and we get a dead cat because the poison kills the cat. So here's the thing. If you don't look inside of that box, do you know if the cat is alive? Do you know if the cat is dead? Do you know if it's in some sort of in-between state? Do you know if the cat's even in there anymore? Do you know if it's even a cat anymore? You have no idea until you look, right? But as soon as you look, as soon as you look, all of a sudden, the outcome is there. There's no getting around it. That's the only way it can be. But if you don't look, it could be one, it could be the other, it could be both. This is a way to describe what's going on with those electrons at the end of that Dr. Quantum video. Hey, you want to hear a quick joke? There's uh, Schrodinger and Heisenberg are driving down the car and are driving down the highway in a car and they get pulled over by the by the cops. And uh, the cop, you know, classic, comes up to the window and, and says, hey, do you guys know how fast you're going? And uh, and Heisenberg says, no, but I know where I was going. Huh? Huh? First half of the joke. And the cop doesn't really understand. So he's like, all right, wise guy, out of the car. So he pulls both Schrodinger and uh, Heisenberg out of the car. And he's like, I'm going to need to search your car. And he goes into the trunk. And as soon as he opens the trunk, he's like, oh, my goodness, did you guys know there's a dead cat in here? And Schrodinger says, what we do now? Huh? Huh? Pretty good, right? Pretty good. It's like two jokes in one and, and all about this lesson. Anyways, okay, I'll stop wasting your time with that. So all this stuff leads us to the quantum mechanical model of the atom. So growing evidence that that electron is behaving less and less like a particle and more and more like a wave, which leads us to Schrodinger's cloud model, which is one about waves and two 
all about probabilities. So if you ever, you know, continue with physics, you might end up learning Schrodinger's equation that actually describes each particle as a wave. It's a doozy. But uh, for now, I'm talking about probabilities. So those, there are places where you've got high probabilities to find electrons and places where you've got lower probabilities or less likely to find electrons. Right? That's fair. It's cool. Now, if it's all based on probabilities, does that mean we don't know anything about anything and we're uncertain about all things? And am I even here? And what am I doing on this planet? And is there another me somewhere else? Well, it's the basis of a lot of science fiction. The short answer is no, right? But, but I mean, there is lots of ideas about multiple universes because if you're made out of electrons, why couldn't your electrons be doing something else at the exact same time? That being said, the probabilities that we're talking about are more like for rolling dice, more like for playing cards and for flipping coins. So on an individual level, yeah, we don't really know, right? You flip one coin, it could be heads or it could be tails. We have no clue. But if you do that a bajillion times, say a billion times, you flip that coin, well, about half of those are going to be heads, about half of those are going to be tails. And the more you do it, the more that 50-50 chance comes in. So like we do you know, 10 coins, you might have four heads, six tails. You do a billion coins, it's pretty much going to be exactly 50% heads and exactly 50% tails. So large numbers, we're very certain about. Smaller numbers, we are significantly less certain about. Okay, so that quantum model based on waves and based on probabilities. It's actually able to explain all the issues with the Bohr model, and it is to date our best model of the atom. So, the spectra of more complex atoms. Realistically, the quantum model predicts all of the spectra, and again, it's based on probabilities. And if you actually go through and you start learning about this stuff, you learn about those probabilities. We are not getting into it now, but know that it is there and know that people have done it. It also explains why some spectral lines are brighter than others. So here is Mercury, and we see some super bright lines, and then we see this ridiculously dim line that I'm not even sure if you'll be able to see from home. Right? The big idea with this is, again, it's all about probabilities, and people have calculated these probabilities, which is a crazy thing. Like, absolutely crazy. So, the brighter the line, the higher probability you will have for that particular transition. The dimmer the line, the less likely it'll be for that transition. Next thing to talk about, why only certain orbits are allowed? Well, if things are behaving like waves, well, let's have a look. N is equal to 3. I've got one wave, I've got two waves, this is at my third orbital, and then finally I've got three waves, and we end up with, in this case, a trough with a trough, and it'll continue and be a crest with a crest, trough with a trough, crest with crest, trough with trough. You may remember that as constructive interference, and it forms a nice standing wave. Whereas in between, let's do this again here, so I'm just going to start right here, here's one wavelength, here's two wavelengths, and then finally here is three wavelengths, but wait a second, if I continue this other one out here, now all of a sudden I've got destructive interference the whole time, destructive interference, that's not going to form a standing wave, that's not going to be happy, it's not going to be very likely that it's there. You'll never guess how many wavelengths at n is equal to four. One, two, three, four, and we create yet another standing wave. Awesome, fantastic. Finally, why the orbiting electrons are not emitting EMR. Because remember, Maxwell said that anytime we have orbiting charged particles, or sorry, accelerating charged particles, we create EMR. They give off EMR. And if they're giving off energy, well, they should be losing speed, and they should spiral and crash into the center, and matter should take up essentially no space, and that's not what we see. So the whole key is, well, if the electrons are behaving like waves, then they're not behaving like charged particles, and charged particles, again, are the things that give off EMR, not waves. So if they behave like waves, they don't have to be giving off EMR, which is pretty cool. So anyways, that is Unit 5. It is, uh, the end of Unit 5 is a bit of a wild ride, a bit of a, a bit of a, thing that blows your mind, realistically, getting into this quantum stuff. It's super, super, super interesting. Um, I hope you enjoy Unit 5. Um, thanks for hanging out with me. Thanks for watching videos. And uh, 
We'll talk to you again real soon, Physics 30s. Bye for now. Bye.